Amen. Good morning, church family. I hope you all had a good Christmas yesterday. I also wanted to say thank you to everybody that made a Friday service a possibility. I know that was a lot of work uh, with, from a lot of different people, and so I just wanted to tell you all thank you. Uh, I believe that service honored the Lord. Uh, I also wanted to say thanks to Hunter. Uh, he did so much work putting that service together. A couple months ago, I was just kind of, yeah. <laughs> Volunteers, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody that had a part in that. Uh, a few months ago, I was just kind of like, man, I really want to do up our Christmas Eve service, and I want it to be a special service, because uh, Christmas is all about Jesus, and it's easy as we're kind of going through the Christmas season, and we've got celebrations, and we've got gifts to buy, and there's just so much busyness going, but I was like, I really want to just pause on Christmas Eve and remember the reason that Jesus came and celebrate that, and uh Hunter took that and he ran with it and just did a great job. And so thank you to everybody that had a part in that. Philippians chapter number four is where we're going to be. We're going to look at verses eight and nine this morning. Uh, towards the end of all of Paul's writings, uh, he typically will have a section or sometimes an entire chapter filled with these quick but short instructional sentences. And Paul, while well, at the beginning of the book, lay a very important theological foundation and then he wraps up the letter, he will show us what that theology looks like on a street level. And it's important that we don't separate those two. Sometimes we just want to focus on the theology of it and have it all be head knowledge. Other times we'll just want to focus on the practical because it's easier to just, okay, tell me what to do without knowing the why and the motive and the driving factor behind that. But really we can't separate one from the other. It's important that we have the right theology and then we understand what that looks like as we live it out. And the book of Philippians is no different uh, than any of his other writings in that regard. Uh, last week we looked at several of those instructions. And we saw how the result of walking in those instructions results in the peace of God guarding our hearts and guarding our minds. We also saw how this peace is beyond what our minds can do on their own. This is not a natural peace. This is not a peace we can just kind of conjure up. This is not the power of positive thinking. This is a supernatural peace that God gives to us as we walk in the way he has called us to. And so now we're wrestling with today, what do we do with our minds? What do we do with our hearts while they're being guarded by the peace of God? Our minds are not guarded in such a way that leave them empty. Okay, because the peace of God's guarding my mind. I could just sit here and be a blank slate. No, that's not what Paul's going to tell us. The peace of God leads to a certain kind of thinking and a certain kind of living. So what do we do with, the peace, with our minds while the peace of God is guarding them? Well, Paul's going to answer that question for us with this final short set of instructions in verses 8 and 9. And we're going to see the result of living out these instructions is connected to what we saw last week. Last week we saw when we live these out, the peace of God guards our hearts and minds. And at the end of verse number 9, we see something very similar. And the God of peace will be with you. I think we would all raise our hands and agree that we want to experience the God of peace being with us, right? Especially these days. Uh, now, theologically, we know in our minds that God is always with us, right? We know Hebrews 13, 5. It says, keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. We know that intellectually. But more than likely, we've all had seasons of difficulty, seasons of affliction, like Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians that we read just a moment ago, where we've wrestled with the question, God, where are you? Sometimes there's a disconnect between what we know theologically and what we experience functionally, isn't there? So how do we remember, how do we acknowledge, how do we experience the God of peace being with us? Well, let's look at verses 8 and 9 to get our answer this morning. The title of this morning's message is, Walking with the God of of peace. Let's read all of Philippians chapter number four, and then we will dig into these two verses here. The Bible says in Philippians chapter number four, we do have these verses on the screens. Uh, these are the only verses we have on the screens this morning, so we'll be flipping in our Bibles a little bit this morning, and that's okay. But if you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, open it up to Philippians chapter number four. If you have the same Bible I have, it's on page 1787. You probably don't, though. Thank you for laughing at my corny jokes. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Philippians chapter number four, verse number one. Paul says, So then, my dearly loved 
and longed for brothers and sisters. My joy and my crown, in this manner, stand firm in the Lord. Dear friends, I urge Euodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make do with a little and how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, You did well by partnering with me in my hardship. And you, Philippians, know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my needs several times. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance I am fully supplied. I have received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you greeting. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your spirit would anoint the preaching of your word this morning. Lord, I pray that your word would be good news to those of us who are poor in spirit. I pray that your word would heal those of us who are brokenhearted. I pray that your word would be liberty to those who are held captive. Lord, whether they're captive to sin I pray that your word would be liberty to them this morning, that it would bring them freedom. Lord, as we're going to look at what we're supposed to think about this morning, I pray that if any of us are held captive to thought patterns that do not align with the peace of God, that your word would set us free from those things. Lord, I pray that your word would proclaim your favor. I pray that it would comfort those who would mourn. And that it would give those who mourn a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Festive oil instead of mourning. Splendid clothes instead of despair. And I pray that we, the people of Fresno Church, would be called righteous trees planted by you. To glorify you in everything, in the way we think, and in the way we live. We ask this in your name. Amen. Our first thought this morning as we jump into our message, we find from verse number 8. Verse number 8 again says, Finally, brothers and sisters... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, then he kind of sums these six things up. If there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. So our first thought this morning as we look at verse number eight is saturate your mind in what is right. Saturate your mind in what is right. Now, before we look at these different criteria, I want us to start at the end of the verse. Paul says, dwell on these things. The, uh, the, Greek word for verse, the Greek word for dwell means to reckon. It means to count. It means to compute or take into account. 
It also means to consider. Now, the way Paul ends this sentence shows us that this is a command. Paul isn't just giving us a filter to filter out bad thinking, although verse 8 can do that. But it's not just a filter to eliminate bad thinking. It's actually a command to think on these things. So what he's helping us understand is he's saying, hey, don't just eliminate the bad, but I'm actually commanding you, I'm challenging you in the Holy Spirit to dwell on things that match these criteria. Paul isn't simply, simply offering good advice. Under the leading of the Holy Spirit, he's telling us what we need to think about, what we need to saturate our minds with. And some of these categories, as we look at them, are going to be a little bit broader than what we're typically used to. These categories help us to assess whether or not our thinking is in alignment with the peace of God that is now guarding our hearts and our minds. But just because some of them are broad doesn't mean that they are abstract. That's why each of these six descriptions starts with the phrase, whatever is. Paul could have just said whatever is and then listed them. But he put that whatever is at the beginning of each one of these six things to help us understand we need to add each one of these things into our thinking. Each one of these things need to inform what we're dwelling on. Each one of these six things are what we are to saturate our mind with. The reason we so often don't experience the peace of God is that our minds are filled with the opposite of these things. Our minds are filled with what is false, or what is dishonorable, or what is unjust, or impure, or ugly, or disgraceful, or detestable. And so Paul tells us to intentionally dwell on something, dwell on these six things, because they're going to help you bring your thinking into alignment with the peace of God. Now that we have given our problems to God in prayer, and we have cast our anxieties on him and the peace of God is now guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. These six things help us know does my thinking fall into alignment with the peace of God? The point is, we are not simply victims of negative thinking that leads to unhealthy or even sinful emotions or actions. We are in control of what goes on inside of our minds. And the first criteria that he gives us is dwell on things, dwell on whatever is true. As people of God, we should love the truth. We should not give any space in our minds for things that we know are false. Paul is helping us understand we don't saturate our thinking with gossip. We don't saturate our thinking off of rumors. We don't, t tabloids that thrive off of rumors or innuendos or clickbait headlines should not be what we as God's children dwell on because we value what is true. It's helpful to remember that as we consider what goes into our mind, as we consider what we dwell on, it's helpful to remember that most people in the world care more about getting clicks or money or votes than they often care about what is true. And so as believers, the first, this first criterion eliminates a lot of things that fight for our attention, doesn't it? Think on things that are true. There is only one perfect wellspring of truth, and that is Jesus. And John 14, Jesus said, I am the truth. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. And so as believers, we want to make sure that the word of God, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus is what is saturating our hearts and saturating our minds. If we spend more time with these headlines that we don't know that are true, then we do the word of God. There's going to be an imbalance in our hearts. There's going to be an imbalance in our spirit. And what we're going to find is that we're not actually walking with the God of peace because we're walking with things that are false. Dwell on what is true. Next, Paul says, dwell on whatever is honorable. Honorable simply means worthy of respect. Now, sometimes there are things in life that are true that we need to deal with, but they are not worthy of respect. This is where I struggle a lot, <laughs> personally, because there's these things that are true, but they're not honorable, and so what happens is they get too much time and space and attention. They drive my affections to the point I have to step back and say, wait a minute, this situation is not honorable, and I need to add honorable. I need to add worthy of respect into the equation of what I dwell on and what I saturate my mind with. So if there are things that are true that we need to deal with, but they're not honorable, deal with it, but don't dwell on it. Deal with those, th those things, but don't dwell on them. Now, there are also things that this world calls honorable that are not. 
How many of you have seen that? We know that because we have an objective standard, the Word of God. The Word of God is our objective standard for what is true. That is the ultimate litmus test. We know in and of ourselves, or any system that's made up of people, we know ultimately it's going to fall short of that truth because we are all fallen. There's none righteous, no, not one. And so our objective standard is the Word of God. And we know that because we have that objective standard, there are certain things that we cannot call honorable because to do so would not be true. But we can't take one category and ignore the rest. Paul does tell us, think on things that are honorable. Think on things that are worthy of respect. So within the scope of what is true, based on the word of God, dwell on what is honorable. Dwell on what is worthy of respect. Headlines are full of dishonorable deeds. Don't let that be what's rattling around inside your head. Dwell on what is true and dwell on what is honorable. And then Paul says, he commands us, dwell on what is just. Dwell on what is just. Now, just or justice is a bit of a loaded term recently, isn't it? I feel like the last few years I've preserved, regardless of the outcome of a high-profile case, you have one side that's saying, yay, justice was done, and then you have the other side that's saying, this was an injustice. (laughs) Everyone seems to have their own definition of what is just, and it honestly reminds me a lot of Judges 21, 25, where the Bible says everyone did whatever seemed right to him. That's a sad, scary place to be. So with so many different definitions of the word, let me encourage you to get your definition from the word of God. If you've never done it, let me encourage you, dig into the word of God and get a healthy biblical understanding of what is just. Study what the Bible says are expressions of God's justice. And there's a really important piece of this definition of the word that Paul gives us here. When you look up this word, It means righteous, observing divine laws. Oftentimes there's a cry for justice with an ignorance of righteousness. And so what Paul is helping us understand is that God's justice really also is based on what God says is right and wrong. That's why we need to understand what God says is right and wrong. Any man-made definition of justice will fall short because it falls short of God's divine righteousness. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not even one. And so let's be a people who care about what's just. Christians should care about justice. That should matter to us because God is just. And Paul is telling us here, dwell on what is just. Saturate your mind with what is just. Let's be a people who love just dealings. I've noticed it's so easy to fall in our camps on big justice issues and not wrestle with the question, is my life marked by just dealings? In these little spaces of my life. Let's be honest, a a lot of the big headlines don't affect a lot of us. And it's easy to fall into our camps on that. But what Paul is encouraging us to saturate our minds with is, is my life marked by just dealings? Does my thinking reflect the justice I see represented in Scripture? Don't settle for the world's subjective definition of justice. Dwell on God's objective righteousness. Dwell on what is true. And then as you're dwelling on what is true, ask yourself, am I also dwelling on what is honorable? And as I'm dwelling on what is true and what is honorable, ask myself, am I also dwelling on what is just? But the next Paul commands us to dwell on what is pure. Dwell on what is pure. I love how some of these are so objective and then some of them we find are a little more on the subjective side. And and, and this one is relevant for, for multiple reasons. God is giving us multiple ways to assess what we think about so we can bring our thinking into alignment with his peace. A just person might think, well, what I'm doing or thinking doesn't hurt anyone, so it's not unjust. So why does it matter? It's okay. But a person who is also mixed into their thinking, the idea or the category of purity can step back and say, this isn't okay. It's not okay for me to think this. It's not okay for me to do this because it's not pure. And boy, there are a lot of impure things fighting for our attention, aren't they? Purity isn't really a subjective thing. (laughs) Some of these things, like lovely, might be more subjective. Purity isn't. The Greek word that Paul uses here, it means pure from carnality or chaste or modest. Things like pornography are running rampant in our society. And you might think, well, 
if it's just something I'm looking at or just something I'm saying, does it really count as sexual immorality? But the biblical word for sexual immorality or fornication is the Greek word pornos. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to figure this out. The unsaved world knows that this is wrong. According to the education database online, 43% of people who use the internet who use the internet visit pornographic websites. This is an old study too, so I'm sure these stats have changed since then. But this statistic said some 40 million Americans are regular visits to porn sites with pornographic downloads representing 35% of everything downloaded from the internet. 35%. Of the 40 million regular visitors, 33% are women. This isn't just a man's problem. A full 70 percent, a full 70 percent of men aged 18 to 24 visit porn sites monthly. Singer-songwriter Billie Eilish, um, Eilish said in a recent interview that she began watching porn at the age of 11 years old. And she said in this interview, it has really destroyed my brain. And what I love about Paul's command here these instructions that he's giving us, they help us to combat this epidemic because it tells us to fill our mind with what is pure. Fill your mind with what is chaste. Fill your mind with what is clean. Yes, eliminate the bad. Cut it out of your life. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. Jesus is saying, don't let this be the sin that drags you into hell. Take whatever drastic steps are necessary. You might need to get rid of your smartphone. You might need to get rid of your computer. You might need to get rid of your internet. I don't know what crazy lengths you have to go to. But yes, cut it out. But as you eliminate the bad, fill your mind with the good. (laughs) Dwell on what is pure. As much as we are commanded in Scripture to eliminate the uh, impure from our life, we're also commanded to fill our minds, saturate our minds with what is pure. And then he instantly follows that up with, fill your mind with what is lovely. Paul is telling us to stir in the category of beauty. A beauty. It's 1,000% vital that we live by what is true. We must go to great lengths to ensure that we have the correct doctrine. And don't just take what I say up here as word for it. Be like the Bereans. I say this, you go home and study it to see if it's true. We must go to great lengths to make sure that we're living by truth. That is 1,000% vital. But God has also created our hearts to be captured by beauty. It's the beauty of Christ that draws our hearts to him. God doesn't want us to fill our minds with things that are just but are also ugly. That's why we can't just take one of these categories all by itself. It's all of these categories put together. So yes, what is true, what is just, but is it beautiful? Is it lovely? Does it stir up your affections for Jesus? God doesn't want our minds to be filled with things that are true but impure. We are made to be wowed by the lovely things of God. Friend, when was the last time you just turned off your phone and you watched God set the sun? Or you just went outside and looked at the stars? And let the beauty of God's creation fill your heart? When was the last time you just sat and listened to a piece of music just to enjoy it? And you just let it move you? When was the last time you just admired some good art? Good art that was pure, that was true. Turn off the news, turn off the social feeds, turn off all the noise, turn it all off and go admire something lovely that God has created for you. I mean, today is one of the five days in Fresno's our skies are legitimately blue. Go outside and enjoy it. I mean, personally, I've noticed my mind isn't so anxious when I'm surrounded by God's creation. Say, Pastor Nick, is that why you go to Yosemite all the time? You must be an anxious dude. Yeah, I am. (laughs) Take some time and ponder heaven. We can't even comprehend the beauty of what we're going to experience for all of eternity. Take some time and try to figure it out. You won't perfectly figure it out, and that's the point. 
as you ponder it and as you wonder, just hit a wall of glory that just causes you to worship God. God, this is so beautiful, I'll never even figure it out. Thank you. Praise your holy name. Take some time this afternoon and ponder your salvation. Think about the beauty of the fact that the God of the universe became a baby to save your eternal spirit. Dwell on the truth that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Dwell on what is lovely. Saturate your heart and your soul in what is beautiful. Dwell on what is lovely. And then lastly, Paul tells us to dwell on what is commendable. Fill your mind with what is commendable. Now this is another one that maybe is a little bit more on the subjective side. This is not given to us as an absolute criterion. Just because someone commends something doesn't mean it's good. We've acknowledged that. This one is similar to honorable in that people can honor or they can commend things that should not be honored or commended. However, that doesn't mean we just ignore this category either. As believers, whether or not something is commendable still matters. It's a big deal to us. Of the six categories Paul gives us to influence our thinking, commendable, honorable, can, this, can good things be said about this are things that we need to wrestle with. And what Paul is helping us understand is we should not be filling our minds with things that are offensive. That's what it means to be commendable. Offensive things should not be what's rattling around in our brains. It shouldn't be what is drawing our affections. As Christians, we know we don't try to offend people by what we think or say. Now again, we don't sacrifice this for truth, but that doesn't mean because we care about truth that we can just run around offending people all the time. I've heard people say, if you're not offending somebody, you're doing something wrong. False! Like, I'm pulling a Dwight Schrute. That is just verifiably false. Romans 12, 18. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Remember last week, let your gentleness be known to everyone. Live at peace with everyone. And so if your life is marked by constantly offending people, friend, you've got it wrong. You're disobeying scripture. And I say that in love because I care about you. And because I care about myself, I've been like practicing this myself. <laughs> we need to wrestle with, is what is filling my mind, is it commendable? Or is it offensive? Is it offensive for offense, just to be offensive? I mean, how many headlines have we seen that they're just mean just to get you to click on it? I can't believe what so-and-so said. And then you read what they said and it's nothing, right? It's offensive and it's untrue. <laughs> Think on things, dwell on things, saturate your mind with what is commendable. So think about things that we can lift up and elevate as good. A mind that's being guarded by the peace of God will dwell on whatever is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable. Then Paul offers two summary statements to this list of criteria. I, I believe these are summary because he says whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, and then there's this dash as he kind of sums it up. If there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these two things. Dwell on these things. Again, this shows us that our thinking is not something that happens to us, but something that we choose. Even our subconscious thoughts that we don't often realize that we're thinking, those are fueled by what we consciously saturate our minds with. And so Paul is telling you, if you're struggling with your subconscious thoughts, what we need to do is fuel our conscious thoughts with what we know falls into this category. Saturate your mind with what is right. But Paul isn't telling us to only think a certain way. He's also calling us in verse 9 to live a certain way. So if we want to experience the peace of God, or the God of peace being with us, Paul says, this is the way we live as well. So our first thought, saturate your mind with what is right. Our next thought comes from verse 9. Look at it again in your Bibles, Philippians 4, 9. Do, do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Our second thought this morning is practically live out what is right. Practically live out what is right. Paul is once again exhorting this church to follow him as he follows Jesus. When he said, do what you've learned and received from me. 
hey, I've taught you guys this. I've given you guys this. Now do it. But when you compare Scripture with Scripture, what you'll notice is Paul isn't claiming to be the originator of what he is giving the church at Philippi. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. If you're on a smart tablet or device or smartphone, just click, click there. That doesn't sound as good, but, you know, get there with whatever Bible you have. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. I want us to see this. Paul is telling the church at Corinth, now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, it's like I, I, I want you to understand something. I want to make this very, very clear. The gospel I preached to you, which you received. So Paul is telling the church at Corinth, and he's telling the church at Philippi, and he says this throughout the epistles, what I'm preaching to you, I'm actually giving this to you. This is a gift. He says, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you've taken your stand, and by which you're being saved. If you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I pass on to you, this is the connection I want us to see. He's giving this to them, they received it from him, for I pass on to you is most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So what Paul is doing when he's encouraging them, hey, what I've given you, what you've received, what you have heard from me, I want you to do it. Now, he's not claiming to be the originator of this. What he's encouraging this church to do is live out what they have ultimately been given by God. Paul's like, I'm just a conduit. I'm just a conduit. This is, from, this is from God, and I want you to live out the gospel that you have been given by God. Live out the teaching that I have given you. In the book of Acts, you see Paul would often preach into the night to the point people were falling asleep and falling out the window. <laughs> Paul would often teach, and he would give them the gospel. He gave them sound doctrine. But then Paul also says, what you have heard from me and what you've seen in me. Heard and seen at a personal touch. This isn't just a lecture that they read from Paul. They saw his life. And because they knew this was real in Paul's life, it was a no-brainer when Paul would say, hey, follow me. Because they've seen Paul live this out. What a challenge for those of us who teach. Whether you're discipling somebody, you're teaching a more formal setting. What a challenge. Paul says this throughout, and, I, and I, I go back to 1 Thessalonians 2 because it's one of those passages these last few months God has really been using in my heart. But we see this in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. Paul said, we cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Because you'd become dear to us. We see Paul has that same dear family-type relationship with the church at Philippi. Paul had given himself to these churches, the church at Corinth, the church at Thessalonica, the church at Philippi. He had given the, himself to these churches, and he is exhorting them to live your life in alignment with what they had seen in his life and ultimately what they saw in Jesus. Paul is saying, everything I've taught you, everything that I've gave you, and everything that you saw in my life, do them. Do them. What I love about this is it shows us the importance of the educational elements of discipleship. We need to teach doctrine. We need to teach, thus saith the Lord. But then there's also a relational element of discipleship. People need the truth, but then they also need to see it in action, up close and personal, and that's what this church had from Paul. Paul taught the truth, and then he lived out the truth with these people. And so the challenge for us is, as we look at verse 9, don't simply settle for knowing the right thing. Don't simply settle for knowing the right thing to say. Sometimes we think, okay, I understand it and I can articulate it, so I'm good. No, don't simply settle for knowing the right thing, but by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit, live it out. Thinking the right way and living the right way are how we walk with the God of peace. In conclusion, I want to read a, a longer quote from A.W. Tozer that's so helpful. A.W. Tozer said, what we think about when we are free to think about what we will, that is what we are or what we will soon become. So wherever your mind goes when you're free to think, that's either what you are or what you will soon become. He goes on to say, anyone who wishes to check on his true spiritual condition may do so by noting what his voluntary thoughts have become over the last hours or days. Ouch. <laughs> you want to really see where you're at spiritually. Think about what you think about. He asks, what has he thought about when free to think what he pleased? 
towards what has his inner heart turned when it was free to turn where it would? When the bird of thought was let go, did it fly out like a raven to settle upon floating carcasses? Or did it, like the dove, circle and return to the ark of God? Such a test is easy to run, and if we are honest with ourselves, we can discover not only what we are, but what we are going to become. We'll soon be the sum of our voluntary thoughts. He says the best way to control our thoughts is to offer the mind to God in complete surrender. Now, the surrender that Tozer is referring to is not a one-and-done decision. It's not as simple as, okay, I heard the sermon, God, I give you my mind, and now I go on my merry way. This type of growth that we want to see, walking with the God of peace, and the God of peace will be with you, it is an intentional and slow and incremental, and it takes time. Having the peace of God be our default takes time. This type of living is an in-it-for-the-long-haul type of living. Think decades. Yes, it's moment-by-moment decisions. It's moment-by-moment decisions to say, okay, God, I'm going to surrender my mind to you. Lord, I've noticed my emotions are struggling lately. My affections are off. And so let me confess the thinking that is driving those emotions, and I want to surrender my mind to you. It's doing that week by week, day by day, sometimes moment by moment. It's moment by moment decisions to choose our thinking and choose our actions over the course of our lives as we continue to learn to walk with the God of peace. And as we continue to bring our thinking and our living into alignment with the word of God, we will continue to experience the peace that goes beyond human understanding. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we, like the writer of Psalms 19, would say, like he said, that we would meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. I pray that we would delight in your statutes, Lord, and not forget your word. And as we saturate our minds with your words, I pray that your spirit would lead us into being doers of the word. Not just hearers, not just knowers, but doers. Teach us to walk with you, the God of peace. And may your spirit continue to just cut through anything that would hinder our peace. Holy Spirit, continue to reveal us where our thinking, where our actions, where our affections are not in alignment with the God of peace, where we are not walking with